Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Tabard Inn, new American cuisine in one of Washington, D.C.'s oldest hotels, located in DuPont Circle. For more information, visit tabardin.com. This week on Meet and 3, I'm about to go on maternity leave. This is Katie Mosman-Wadler, and before I leave you in the incredibly capable hands of Team HRN, we're rounding out Season 5 with a deep dive into the food rules, weird cravings, and overall hype about eating while pregnant. There are a lot of safe foods to eat, and we shouldn't be sort of assuming that just because something is raw that it's dangerous. I just found myself feeling like there was an alien piloting my body and brain and uh, totally changed the way that I ate. So was it the eggplant? Sure. Why not? I just don't know. Tune in to this week's episode of Meet and 3 anywhere you listen to podcasts. I'll be back soon with our newest and tiniest producer in tow. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. On our first episode of 2020, we are joined by Chef Josh Emmett, who just released his newest cookbook, The Recipe. It spans 150 of world's famous chefs and 300 plus of what he considers to be the classic recipes of the last 50 years. You can check out recipes from Daniel Boulud, Dominique Ansel, and Jean Georges, while Chef talks to us about the skills that connect all of these incredible chefs and some tips for cooking for your home kitchen. Later in the show, our studio engineer, Jeet, sits down with singer-songwriter Mia Gladstone, who performs a live blend of R&B, pop, and jazz for us. Her debut EP, Grow, earned high praise, and her latest single, Geekin, has been turning heads, too. So sit back, relax, and here's another episode of Snacky Tunes. We talk about food. We talk about music. With musical dudes. Finger on the pulse. Snacky Tunes. Living in the fun, hold it 
Welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm one half your host, Greg Bresnitz. Uh, I am on the line with Josh Inet, uh, who is calling all the way from New Zealand. Chef, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, it was great meeting you last year during your book release for the recipe here in New York. It was wonderful to have that home-cooked meal uh, in that beautiful apartment. Yeah, that was fun, right? Um, seems like seems like a decade ago now, but yeah, that was uh, that was a good time. We had a great time up in New York when we were there. Yeah. Uh, so you grew up in Hamilton, New Zealand, and one of the things you talk about in your childhood is this huge walk-in pantry that was fully stocked, but the actual meat of the meal was not in there. Uh, what are some stories of pulling together meals from the pantry, and what lessons did you learn? on how you cook from a uh, fully stocked reserve? Well, we always had, um, one thing we didn't buy was a lot of processed ingredients, I think. And we lived on a farm, so we had, uh, you know, a lot of fruit trees and a pretty uh, a reasonably good vegetable garden. Um, but, you know, my mother uh, always encouraged us uh, either to get out of the house and get out and play around on the farm or, you know, uh, I was often in the kitchen and I was allowed to make, um, sort of whatever I wanted. We had all the ingredients that you could, you know, lots of eggs. We had chooks, um, chickens, um, you know, running around. And, and, and so we could make um, cakes and that sort of thing. And I had a bit of a sweet tooth, so I made a huge amount. Of, I started baking at quite a young age. I made a huge amount of cakes. Um, and I suppose the great thing about that was that you, you made a cake, you owned the cake, so you we, we ate as much as we, we liked. Um, there wasn't much of a restriction put on that. Um, so it was brilliant, uh, for me and my brother and my sister and that sort of thing. So that's really where cooking started for me. What was the, what ended up being your cake specialty from childhood? I made all sorts. I made a, a chocolate caramel slice, which um, was one of the first things I used to make pavlovas, lots of different versions of pavlovas, uh, all sorts of biscuits, Anzac biscuits, or, you know, your classic chocolate chip cookies or, um, what else? Is it? Banana cakes. Made a lot of banana cakes. We always seem to have bananas floating around and um, different icings. So, you know, a lot of your real classics. Um, but, I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. And what are some of the lessons from those days that you still carry through to cooking these days? Um, have confidence in recipes. I think I used to, I, I remember thinking back then even, even, when I was when I was making cakes then that I wasn't I, I, you know it was the first time for me and I wasn't really sure that anything would ever work out um, and I think even these days I'm I, I'm not overly I'm quite skeptical of things until I try them you know I, I in terms of recipes and that sort of thing but it's amazing um, what does work and why it works and understanding and also with pastry definitely you follow the recipe but once you've got a bit of confidence and you can actually you know, you know the rest of it, then you start breaking the rules. Um, but definitely don't break the rules with, with pastry and, and that style of cooking until you actually have a foundation of knowledge um, that allows you to break the rules. Once you left uh, culinary school, you made your way out to London. How did you get your first culinary job? 
London, I went to, uh, my brother had been just left to London and um, I wanted to get it, desperate to get out of New Zealand as well. Like like most young Kiwis, uh, when they leave school, want to go and do a OE and, you know, spend um, a few years abroad. So uh, London, I, I sort of stumbled across my first job there and didn't really know where I was going or what to do. Didn't know a lot of people. So took a first sort of job, but knew that within the first year of being in London, I was going to travel a lot as well. Um, you know, I was going to take three months off and go and I, actually, when I got there, I went and spent two months in Turkey, um, which was, which was amazing. That was sort of 27 years ago now. Um, and, uh, you know, then I'd work for four or five months and then hand in my notice and go and work, um, mm. go on holiday again, right, for another couple of months, three months. And, and you know, that's part of it, right? You've, you've lived in New Zealand and were quite um, secluded from the rest of the world. So you really wanted to get out and see things and experience things. Uh, and then and then the, probably the second year in London, I really got serious and got into a good kitchen and, and, a, and a really good restaurant and um, started to really focus on my um, my job and career a little bit more. And then you came back to Melbourne for uh, to work under Donovan Cook at SSS, which I, I think is like mm-hmm. incredible. Well, how what was the time there, and, and what were some of the things that began to really shape you as a uh, under the tutelage? <laughs> Yeah, well, that was a really interesting process because when I, the, I I let my I stupidly let my visa run out in in the UK and mm. I had about two weeks left and I was working for a good a uh, good guy there called Stephen Terry and he said, well, you could go and work for a mate of mine, Gordon Ramsay. He's you know he might be able to sponsor you, um, or you know if your only other option is to go to Australia, um, you could go and work for a friend of mine, Donovan Cook. So those are really my two options. Um, and I and I ended up going down to Australia because the visa thing was just left too short. And and but Australia, I spent three years in Australia and I worked incredibly hard. I um, generally worked uh, six days a week. Uh, we worked very early in the morning until very late at night. I didn't have much of a life, so I didn't really enjoy Melbourne as such very much. Um, but I packed so much work into those three years. I, you know, I literally worked my ass off and um, learned a huge, huge amount. So it was it was a real life changing um, sort of three years for me. And I did a three years solid with Donovan and took as much knowledge um, as possible as I could from him. So it's a, it's, that was a quite an integral part of my career. What was one of the best things that he left you with? He um, it's just a, a hard work, detail, and and dedication, and and, and respect. Um, you know, I needed he, you know, he wouldn't let me t- touch fish or meat or you know any of the fish or meat preparation until I had, you know, everything else sorted. I used to have to come in earlier in the morning to try and get all my vegetable prep done and that sort of thing, and then. If I wasn't done quick enough and I wasn't done fast enough and my work wasn't good enough, he wouldn't let me touch the fish or he wouldn't let me touch the meat. So he sort of drip fed that sort of stuff and he had so much knowledge in that area. Um, and he sort of made, you know, he drip fed it to me and, and it taught me a huge amount of respect for being able to, you know, uh, work hard and, 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 and um, you know, you had to earn your stripes with him, definitely. Uh, but, you know, I, I learned the right way and, and it made me really, you know, very good at my job very quickly. Uh, from there, uh, you went to luxury yachts. And I, I'm just so curious after working in such kind of like high end, uh, really kind of like just accoladed starred restaurants, what, what did you take from luxury yachts? You know, what was the, the kind of knowledge and skills um, that you uh, left there with and how many years are you on the boats? I was only I was only actually on boats for I think four months in total and um, which is sort of a season right it's a summer season uh, in Europe and we were based in the south of France and you know on the whole I didn't really enjoy that process um, I loved you know we were just we, the best part about it was we would call into these you know amazing little ports and um, uh, various bays and, and different places and we'd go ashore and go to the markets and look for produce and it was hugely seasonal and amazing produce up and down the you know the, the Italian coast or the French Riviera and um, out on the islands uh, and the cooking was really really amazing but um, you know it definitely wasn't for me I was working with I was myself as a 
sort of the chef and then I had an assistant with me um, and we probably had people on our boat half the time. Um, so it, it, it's a funny old thing. It, you feel like you're living a life beyond your means um, because you live on this boat and, and um, it's a strange one. I really wanted to be back in a, in a, in a, in a kitchen, you know, learning as much as I can, uh, could. So that's sort of why I, I, I left the yachts, did it for a small amount of time to get enough money to get back to London. Um, and that's what it did provide me. It provided me a, a good cash influx to sort of actually get back into London and get myself set up again to get back into a good kitchen. Right. And then this is the beginning of your 10 years with uh, Chef Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, I left the boat, did an interview with Gordon. Um, he gave me a uh, job pretty much on the spot. Uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, he, that kid, at that time it was, it had just been voted one of the worst places to work in Britain, actually, and he had just been on a show <laughs> called Britain's Worst Bosses, and I went and spent a day in the kitchen and absolutely loved it, and, um, you know, I didn't ask any questions, right? I didn't, I wasn't bothered what I was getting paid or why or how many hours I was working. It was just, when can I start? I'm in. Let's go. Um, and it was, yeah, I had an, an incredible, yeah, almost seven years with him. Which is which is phenomenal, um, and and from him, I mean, you already had such great tutelage and great great chefs. But like, what were the lessons, and like, what were the examples? Like, what did he teach you about being a restaurant tour and a chef? Yeah, uh, it, you know, a lot of what I know today, you know, um, definitely attention to detail because it's, and his standards were just so high, and sort of don't leave any stone unturned. Um, if you you know if you walk in and you have an intuition and you do as a chef right you walk into a kitchen and you have an intuition intuition that something's not right don't walk past it you know um dig and dig under this and scratch under the surface and it's amazing what you find um and don't ever assume anything you know um if Produce and food and kitchens, are, you know, they're an ever-evolving thing and, and, and produce changes and seasons changes, uh, change constantly and everything's moving. Nothing's, nothing that you deal with is generally, it's very hard to standardise. So you just have to constantly pay a huge amount of attention to everything you do and watch it constantly um, because as soon as you take the eye off it, 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 it it's, it's gone wrong. You know, um, and I, you know, I loved working for him. I loved working hard, and I, I, you know, just working with passionate people. It was, it was, it was. We were hugely focused on the food and the service. But you know, I was a chef, and as I've always been a chef, and hugely, hugely, hugely focused on the food. Uh, it was, you know, that was it. Be all and end all. If it, if if it's not right, it's gone. If it's if it's great, it's great. We were just focused on making sure everything was fantastic every day. And, and flipping it around the other side, uh, you spent five seasons as a judge on MasterChef New Zealand. What advice and what kind of guidance did you find was the most useful for the contestants or what type of critique did you felt um, really uh, kind of hit the heart of the, the contestants? Yeah, a lot of the contestants, it was an amazing experience. And a lot of the contestants that came on board were, were, were really good cooks. You've got a lot of great cooks in New Zealand who are very... Um, you know, they, they've got a really good knowledge of the basics and they love their food and are passionate about what they're doing. But a, a lot of it is um, organization, cleanliness and, and structure, you know, and you would want to get them in and get them into a process pretty early. And we would help, this is one thing we could give them general advice on um, as a group. We would sort of say, listen, you're going into a challenge. You need to get yourself set up. You need to get the right equipment around you early. You need to keep a clean bench. Um, and although that's not focusing on the end product of the food, the food, well, you work organized, you work better and you work more logically, you're twice as fast and the end result in the food is always better, uh, you know, um, and it just helps them, helps them get through. But we, the best thing about doing that show was the, just the food we ate. We ate incredibly good <laughs> food a lot of the time and, and that's a hugely enjoyable thing, right, to be cooked for and eat great food. Um, and you know, paid. the disappoint. Yeah, totally. And the disappointing <laughs> thing is when, the, uh, you know, if, the, if, if we had a day where we had not great food, you know, you're not making a great show. Um, it was difficult to make a great show 
with bad food because everyone just gets down. You know, you just it's hard to it's hard to be up and um, smiling about things when you it becomes quite negative quite quickly because people get the yeah you get depressed if you get bad food you're like oh god that was terrible and that was great and that wasn't all good and it all just goes a bit sideways so good food great show so it was really important that they were you know had their best we're going to take a quick musical break and play a song from our archives and then we'll be back with Josh Emmett. And then we're back with Chef Emmett to talk about his new cookbook, The Recipe, here on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network. So, Chef, you wrote a book called The Recipe, uh, whose tagline is, the most important recipes everyone should cook in a lifetime. Before we get into the book, I'd love to know, what do you define as a classic recipe? The classic recipe is something that is ingrained in people's lives and in their, and, and in culture and in sort of all throughout society and and you know what these dishes are they're dishes that uh, that everyone knows they all eat they all um have a, a, a sort of part of their lives and whether that's you know that's um something as simple as you know you're in england and it's prawn cocktail or you're in um you know part of america and that's a, a chowder or a, um a, you know a clam chowder or something like that or it's you know you're in asia and it's it's congee um there's these recipes that have been around for a long long time they're there for a reason they're great for a reason they're very recognizable um if you ask you know your average person what it is they'll generally know what what exactly what it is you know, um, some of these have become more prevalent in recent years. You know, who you like, if you ask an average New Zealander what laksa is, they'll be able to tell you. They'll, they might not be able to list all the ingredients, but they may have eaten one, but they'll know what it is. And that's, the, that's a recipe that's stretched far and wide out of Asia and almost become mainstream in, in, in Western culture. Um, so they're those sorts of recipes. They have to be a thing, you know. And so where did the genesis for this book come from? It's pretty audacious. It's 300 plus recipes that spans the last 50 years. It's, it's very ambitious. Hugely ambitious. And it's one of these projects that if we had known how difficult it was going to be when we, we started, you would never start. Um, you That's know, we decided to one. do, <laughs> yeah, we decided to do, yeah, the, 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 you know, the three or 400 greatest recipes from the last 50 to a hundred years, um, and the recipes supplied by, you know, the world's finest chefs. So there's one thing to compile that list of recipes and, and, and decide on what actually belongs in the book um, and then to match them to chefs from around the world who generally specialise in those areas uh, and get the chefs on board to provide the recipes. Um, and that was, you know, it was a huge process, a very slow process to begin with, Uh yeah, a, a, a very ambitious project, but we, you know, we came out with an incredible result. Were the recipes non-negotiable? Uh, once you had the set list, did you have to find a chef 
meet them or would chefs get into discourse with you to be like, that's not a classic. This is a classic. And you would adapt to you know, the discussion with the chef. No, we would we we would generally send we would send out a list to a lot of the chefs in the early days, and we would suggest what we thought we they would do based on you know um, their area of expertise, uh, and or they might say actually I want to do that one, but I want to do this one as well. So they might do two recipes. Some chefs did three recipes. Majority did one recipe. Um, and you know you've got we were looking for sort of 150 chefs from around the world, and and that was a uh, you know it's an incredibly emotional experience for me. I I know probably 50 percent no one have met. I know 30 or 40 percent well of the chefs that are in the book. I know another 10 or 15 percent I've met, and then there's a percentage that I you know haven't met, but I've had contact with over the process of uh, of doing the book. Um, but, you know, sitting in here from little old New Zealand and, and getting an answer from a chef in, you know, in Paris or in London or New York or whatever that had agreed to participate and pass their recipes was, you know, there was some pretty incredible happy days down here and other days when we didn't get people that we wanted to be involved was quite difficult as well. Um, but once we got once we got that snowballing and the ball rolling, um, you know, and... and, and you know the pressure the, the real pressure on me was that i had to produce something that was exceptional and that was sort of dawned on me as we as we slowly moved through the process yeah um was there one particular white whale that you're like you know i i love everyone equally but you really wanted this particular chef in the book no i don't think there was one particular person but there was a, there was a there's a there's a there's a group of chefs I guess that we were you know there's there's people that we I have huge amounts of respect for, um, so it's a it's a real My mixture crew. you know it's a really it's a super ecstatic that obviously Gordon Ramsay came on board and you know that wasn't a that wasn't a um, a, a, a shoe in just because I had worked for him for years you know everyone's extremely busy and taking time to send recipes is 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 hard work you know there's people like Nigel Slater who's incredible you know you got David Kinch who runs amazing restaurants and David Chang um, uh, Elena and Juan Marie Arzac who run you know Arzac restaurant in Spain uh, you know they're they're like Spanish royalty when it comes to you know food and cooking and chefs so they've been there so many years um and sophie peak who um you know has got two michelin two or three michelin stars and an incredible chef uh martha stewart you know um to get her to agree and and, and be part of it but the, you know there's 150 of those names in the book um it, and it is you, you've seen the list it's a it's a pretty incredible list and some you know it's, very humbling it's an, yeah so when the realization dawned on you <laughs> of what you had to do, um, what changed in your process or, or if anything, or, or, or what kind of doubling down did you have, feel that you had to do once the, the legend of the culinary world started to say yes? Well, it definitely dawned on me. There was a couple of mornings where I just woke up and was like, oh, my God. I, you know, I, the, Then it was the process that we, we got the recipes, we got the chefs, the recipes started being sent to me, um, and I'm cooking all these recipes in my home um, with one of help from a um, girl called Christy who's always helped me with my first two cookbooks. Um, but the pressure of, you know, this book has to be incredible. It has to re represent all these people. Um, it has to be beautiful. Um, and Karen Scott, who uh, is a photographer, um, I've worked with him on previous two, two previous books and works with him a lot. He's, he's a seriously clever guy and really knows um, what angle and what um, sort of direction this book should take. And the, and the book sort of takes a life of its own, right? That's why we turned around and just shot. It was trying to take these personalities that were involved in the book out of the book a little bit because the book is about the recipe. Um, so we shot every dish either on a white or black plate and on a white or black background and generally always overhead shots. So the focus is very much on um, the food, the dish, that's it. Uh, you know, and that flows through the book in terms of the font and the text and, and how it's written. It's written in a sort of a manual format with um, 
tips and tricks and that sort of thing, but the focus is 100% on the food. Um, and that's really what it was about. We had um, a chef that you know wanted to send a photograph of their picture of their food rather than us photographing it. And we sort of had to know, even though uh, he's an incredible, one of the best known chefs in the world, we had to say no to that because it doesn't fit within the the images of, of the rest of the book and it all has to fit perfectly. So, you know, it did take a bit of a life of its own, which I suppose took some pressure off me, but it's still putting, you're still putting someone else's dish on a plate, which it has to, it has to look incredible. They all do. Yeah. Yes. It, yes. One of the interesting things about this book is that um, it's, it's obvious that the recipes are the, the chefs, but um, they also come with accompanying Josh notes. Uh, yeah. Could you give a little insight into the, the tips and the, the tricks that you provide for some of the, the recipes? Yeah, there's, I, it's, the Josh tips are really about the any, – any time you cook a recipe for the first time, you need there's, – there's something you'll pick up along the way, right? And you'll go, oh, shit, I'll, I'll, next time I'll do it that way. Um, or I'll need to know that for next time, you know, because you either use it and they're really simple things. They could be the size of the bowl that you mixed it in, or it could be the way you mixed it, or it could be the steps you did or any, the way you, all sorts of little tricks. Those are the tips that I tried to provide so that the first time people, someone's making this recipe, they, they do hit those certain points and that way it's a no fail, um, right? And that's what it's really about, just the tricks and tips that will allow you to get it right the first time. Um, and these, you know, these recipes are recipes, you know, as we say, that people must cook and should cook or eat at least once in their lifetime. And most people probably have. What advice do you have or what's some of the best advice you have for home cooks who are tackling this book for the first time? Uh, there's, I think people get weary that there's a lot of complex recipes, but I would say 90% of the recipes in this book are simple, um, are an easy category. There's a few, a few ambitious ones in there. Um, but what, you know, you could say that one of the ambitious ones, uh, well, I've, I've got it actually written as easy, but Sean Brock's, um, fried chicken and gravy. Now that's a, it's a labor intensive two, two, two day job to do this fried chicken. And funnily enough, I made it for my kid's birthday last week. Um, and it is next level fried chicken. I mean, it's the best fried chicken recipe I've ever had and eaten. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, so um, advice to people is just to get in there and, and cook, you know, what it's cooking's a, a, a feeling thing, you know, it's like making pasta for the first time. The first time you're probably going to make a really bad job of it. Um, the second time you start to get a feel the third time and fourth and fifth, it starts to come out glorious. Uh, you know, you don't always expect to get things right on the first time. Um, so, you know, doing addition and repeating it's always a good thing. Um, after getting all of these recipes and discussing with these uh, legends, you must have found some commonalities between them or found some kind of like something that bound them together that allowed them to become these creative culinary geniuses. What are some of the things that you discovered about them that link them as, as creatives and human beings? Uh, there's a huge love of food, I think. Uh, you know, when you, I think you, you should never think that any dish is below anyone, you know, because it's just, it's just not. It doesn't matter whether people are, you know, specialize in, you know, three Michelin star high end um, cuisine that uh, simple foods below them because it's not, it never has been. In fact, it's, it's probably more ingrained in their life than anything, um, you know, uh, or that uh, someone who cooks really simple food in a restaurant and runs a, you know, we, whether it's a fried chicken shop or something else that don't have an appreciation of, of, of more complex dishes. I think the bottom line with, with, with most of the chefs is a, is a massive love of food across the board, now, whether that's down and dirty or uh, slick and polished, you know, there's an intrigue and a love and a consistency across uh, that um, for the industry and, and for food in general. Having cooked through all these recipes and doing them, I know the fried chicken is a favorite, but what is the one or two that you've even slipped into your restaurants or to your home cooking rotation after doing all 150 chef, uh, chef 
submissions. Yeah, there's a classic recipe, uh, a cassoulet recipe from um, a French chef called Pascal Orsignac, who lives in London. Um, that is, you know, I've cooked that multiple times. That is next level. Um, it's a beautiful cassoulet recipe. Uh, there's all sorts of, um, you know, really delicious uh, desserts. Um, the um, tiramisu I've made quite a few times, uh, which is from Mark Vetri. Love that. Uh, there's a there's a um, baked sort of custard pudding, um, which is from a chef in uh, he's in South Africa actually, and I've made that multiple times uh, at home, and it's really good. The kids absolutely love it, uh, and it's a really straightforward recipe. Um, so all sorts. There's you can take the the inkling of an idea or or one part of the recipe or even a technique in the recipe. And again, through this process, I learned so much because uh, you know there were, there was recipes that got sent to me. And I, you know I, I'm at the stage where I don't I read a lot of cookbooks, but I don't follow the I, I read look at the pictures and I know what I'm going to do with it. Um, but to go back and actually follow 300 recipes, other people's recipes, and have to follow them to tea, um, a lot of the, you know, there was a percentage of the recipes I looked at and went, really? I'm not really sure about that technique or whether that's, I wouldn't do it like that, I haven't seen it done like that. So there was a lot of stuff I learned that was new to me, new to me which was brilliant. That was part of the learning process for me. Incredible. Well, Chef, thank you so much for uh, putting the effort into compiling this incredible book. Uh, and thank you for making time for us on the show. Uh, where can people find the book, uh, visit your restaurants, send you recipes, get a hold of you? Yeah, Instagram, uh, restaurants, and I've got restaurants throughout New Zealand, Rata, um, which is in Queenstown, Madam Wu, I've got four of those across the country in New Zealand as well. Um, and yeah, definitely Instagram. We, we spend a lot of time on Instagram, actually, which is at Josh Emmett, we do a lot of recipes on there, um, including some from the book, actually, to help people um, with that daily slog of what am I going to eat for dinner tonight. So we post a lot of simple recipes on there to really um, enable people to sort of get through the week and try a few different things and um, eat well. Amazing. Uh, thank you again. Uh, we're going to take another quick musical break with a song from our archives, and then Jeet will be in the studio live with Mia Gladstone here on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network. Thank you. 
episode is brought to you by Tabard Inn. Tabard Inn, Washington, D.C.'s quintessential hotel, is located on a quiet, tree-lined street just five blocks from the White House. Vibrant yet unassuming, the Tabard is comprised of 40 sleeping rooms, each unique in character and design. Feast on an eclectic American cuisine in their acclaimed restaurant, or enjoy a cocktail and listen to live jazz in one of their cozy Victorian seating areas. Mingle with travelers from around the world who find the Tabard the only place to stay when taking their travels to Washington. For more information, visit tabardin.com. Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. This is Jeet. I am here in the studio with Mia Gladstone. Welcome to Snacky Tunes. Thank you so much. How was it getting here? I heard the L train was a bit of a bitch. Yeah. Are we allowed to curse on here? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah, it was really annoying. Um... I like got. I thought I left enough time because I got to Penn Station super early, and then I like got to the train, and it was like it'll be here in twenty minutes. Oh, where are you coming from? So, I come from Jersey. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, me too. R- you, where? Jersey City. Jersey. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're more at like a more communable place. I'm in South Orange, so oh, it's like yeah, you gotta like go NJ to Transit. Wait, just, so you gotta get to yeah, New Jersey Transit to Penn Station. It's so annoying. Yeah, and then. Oh hmm. my god, how annoying. Yeah, but it's like just <laughs> it's just short enough to still be doable, but long enough to be like the most annoying, re- most repetitive thing in the Jeez. world. But you're here. I'm here, and that's what's important. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, how'd you get into music? I've been doing music forever. Like it's just innate within me. Like it's my number one thing that I do. Like, w- were you? Um, Around musical family members or... Yeah, like my, my dad... I guess I just grew up surrounded by music. Like, it was it was always something that we were listening to and... Um, like, what kind of music? Well, my dad... Like, all kinds. My dad really liked, like, classic rock. Like, <laughs> suburban white do. dad. Like, all dads do. <laughs> this is, like, the classic <laughs> rock. And then my mom really liked Kanye and she liked... She liked more of the hip-hop kind of stuff. Wow, interesting. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting mix. And then, I guess, like... I, I kind of found my style because my dad gave me an MP3 player when I was mm-hmm. like six and he just loaded hundreds of songs onto it. Yeah. And I gravitated towards like Stevie Wonder, Lauren Hill, Steely Dan. Nice. Like David Bowie. That's pretty eclectic. Yeah. It's like all kind of all over the place. So how did you get from listening to all these different kinds of influences and then starting to write your own music? Like where did that start? Well, I started writing music when I was like six or seven. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> it, young. It was, yeah, well, because I, I asked my dad to teach me piano when I was seven. And so he started, he didn't know how to play piano. Wait, do your parents play music at all? My dad always played guitar growing up. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, but so I asked him to teach me piano or get me piano lessons. And he was mm-hmm. like, well, I don't really want to pay for lessons. So I'm going to, I'm going to learn piano myself and I'm going <laughs> to teach you so, so he like learned piano online and then he just taught me and i don't know how to read music or anything like i kind of just learned the notes and the that's chords. a pretty kick-ass dad pretty kick-ass yeah i'm, I'm so grateful because yeah. <laughs> it was awesome and like the second i was able to play piano like chords and stuff that's like when i was able to actually put my, all my ideas into song so yeah oh. around when i was seven i guess wow very interesting <laughs> Yeah. So you get into music at around six or seven and you start writing music around that time too? Yeah, because so in second grade, like I had this school talent show and mm-hmm. I was, originally I was like, I guess I'm just going to play a song and sing on piano. And like, I didn't know what I was going to play, but then I just ended up writing a song and that's what I performed. An, an original <laughs> composition? Yeah. For a talent show? That's amazing. Yeah. And then it just became this thing that every year I would do the talent show and I'd always have songs for that. So it was like a big motivator so in writing So when did you music. start recording these ideas? Recording, I think the first time I really recorded was when I was in fifth grade. Because mm-hmm. um, my dad, he, he he had like a recording setup and stuff. Oh my at God, home. your dad is like. My dad is my. <laughs> all around <laughs> he engineer. He helped me so much. <laughs> he engineered the session. <laughs> oh my God. It's, That's amazing. It's so cringy though when I look back on it because like. I, like I heard the recording many years later, and my voice was so like shrill and undeveloped. Obviously, as like a fifth grader, and, but it's like still on the harmonies and stacks that I do now. Just yeah, like yeah. a little kid voice. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, it was it was a lot, but um, it really laid the foundation. I assume it really did. Yeah, like I was like, wow, I can. And also, I think it was back in the day. Like it wasn't like. I would record an idea like bit by bit. It was like I had to write the whole song before Mm. I would record versus now like my process is very broken up. Like I'll start with the beat. I'll do a little bit of the beat. I'll do some vocals over it and I'll like build off of it little by little. So I feel like having that foundation of the discipline of making the whole song was really good. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, and I kind of want to get back to that because I feel like I was a better songwriter when I could just oh, do that. Oh, that's fascinating. I definitely yeah. want to talk about that more, but yeah. let's move into a song. Let's what are you going to perform first for us? Okay, so the first song I'm going to do is called My Tits Grow in the Winter. Love the title. Thank you. <laughs> it's a song about body dysmorphia. <laughs> um, and yeah, that it's a, just a short little snippet. When I'm talking to you, yeah. baby, can you tell me how to feel? Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Do you love me as much as you say? How do you really know what you mean? Baby, tell me what pops in your brain when you see the image of me in your face. Yeah, tits grow in the winter. It throws me out the center. Yeah, my tits grow in the winter. It throws me out the center. Yeah, yeah. I be looking in the mirror. There's this bitch she's staring back. I never see her. I'm always so confused Why she always seems to pop up in my view I don't know her Tits grow in the winter It throws me out of center Yeah, my tits grow in the winter It throws me out of center Yeah So let's talk about your new single, Geekin. Let's talk about it. Yeah, I dropped it super recently. Um, It's a self produced track. So you did everything. I did everything. You made the beat. I did. You recorded your voice. Mm -hmm. And I got my my boy Cicero is featuring on it. Wow, very cool. Thank you. Yeah, that song. Should I talk about how it like? Yes, absolutely. Cool. Um, Well, I made it for my splice pack originally. Nice. So I had to make like a sample beat for it. So the beat is also comprised of like my vocals. Mm -hmm. Like that's Mm -hmm. what I sampled. And um, basically I had to go to D.C. to record this video for Splice. And then my boy sister was from D.C. So I was going to have him hop on the beat. Um, And yeah, so we like did this whole thing, this whole video. And then I really liked how the song came out, but I kind of slept on it. And then... Maybe like six months later, I came across it and I was like, hmm, I should finish this song. (laughs) So we just ended up finishing the song and it was like a very, it was like a family production because it was recorded and engineered by Owen, who who's at Beyond Studios in D.C. Mm -hmm. And um, then he ended up mixing it at the end, too. And it was just like a DMV production, the whole thing, because we recorded it there, too. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So this is kind of like what you were saying before, where the songwriting it's kind of in pieces, and funny yeah. enough for Splice, which is, <laughs> if anybody doesn't know, is uh, where you find beats, yeah. basically. Um, yeah. But you said that you want to start trying to go back to writing full-fledged songs. Well, yeah, just to challenge myself a little more, because in this like new era I'm in in my career, I've been producing everything myself. Mm. And so it, it's become this thing where I'm like, okay, well, to get the, the bass line started, like, I'll just make the beat, mm-hmm. and then I'll do my part and then I'll be like oh I'll add this to the beat rather than like it's not like I make the full beat first you know like it's it's a constant building block do you feel like anytime like it's too much to be able to have to do everything do you feel like there's too much on your shoulders um no well not really because it was like completely my choice to do this Mm -hmm. because I wanted to kind of reverse the roles and I found when I first got into the industry. <laughs> of I was like, I was like, oh, I guess now I'm just a singer, and so I'm gonna have to like sing over beats that other people make and do all this shit. Mm. And then I realized I don't have to do that at all, and you I can, can take actually, more control. I can right. take control and take the power back, and it's been it's been super empowering and rewarding to produce everything myself, and especially continuing to reverse the roles by like featuring rappers on my tracks that I produce, it feels really good. It sounds like you are your father's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> that I am. That's amazing. <laughs> That's really cool. Thank um, you. So, did you say you make a, you say you make a, made a music video for this? Yes. This song? Yeah. So what was that process like? Well, that was amazing. It hasn't come out yet. We're like, I'm Ooh, super very excited. Exciting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we shot it. It was, I'm trying to think, like, so it was originally supposed to be in one day, like, Mm -hmm. and Cicero came from D.C. for this shoot, and then basically, like, last minute, 
where we were supposed to film all this green screen, green screen stuff, they like flaked on us. And I had done this really elaborate makeup and I had so much shit with me. Yeah. And we had to we had to reschedule it and Cicero had to go home. So I had to like bring him back the next week. And it was like, oh my God, it was so stressful. But now I'm so happy that we did it. Oh yeah? Yeah, because everybody around me was kind of like, I don't know if it's worth it for you to do a video for this song. Like, it's so last minute. But I was like, nah, I'm doing the video. Like... It's going to be worth it. And now I'm seeing it paying off. Like, it feels really good. And your videos are quite out there. I saw the Baby Don't Worry video. <laughs> yeah. Man, what was that like? The, the glitter. Oh, my glitter tits. God. Yeah, that was very intense. I, I don't know. Like, hmm. Yeah, I mean, I had done the full glitter body look before. So it wasn't, it wasn't my first <laughs> time. But it was, I definitely made a mess. Um it was like a lot to clean up, a lot to put on, because you have to put like a layer of baby oil first over your skin and then glitter so that the glitter sticks, you know? Uh, so it's like I see. <laughs> a lot goes into see, I'm it. I'm not too familiar with glitter on the body. I don't think most people are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not a very common thing. <laughs> uh, but it was definitely fun. I felt I didn't feel naked. Like okay. walking around, I was like, I feel like I'm wearing a bodysuit right now. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, so what uh, what are you going to sing for us next? Okay, next I'm going to sing a song called Don't Look At Me. And I wrote this song um, after a lot of frustrations being on the subway and people always staring at me when I'm just trying to mind my business and huh. me, me just feeling like a target as a young woman. Oh, why? Oh. Shout out Fresco. I, I, I. I can take two steps along the street without turning hella heads. I think they're onto me. I go about my business on the screen, but they yearn it for my life information on she. It's a beautiful day, so I don't get. Having trouble choosing between longing and your knees You look me up and down like I'm a tree Thinking I don't see the way your fantasies unleash I stare ahead so far away So I don't meet your gaze Beware of a lonely man oh. You ain't getting nowhere near my bubble I'm not flattered, I'ma kick you to the rubble Go about my day, my vision turns into a tunnel I'ma live my life cause it's a beautiful day So I don't care that you can away And I'ma stay back very cool, very cool. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> so you just uh, mentioned in the last segment that your next song, Geekin, is in the works. The music video. The music video is in the works, right? The song's done. The song's out. Mixed, mastered, out. Uh huh. On Spotify. Uh huh. Title. All, Apple, all of the above. All, <laughs> all streaming services. Yes. It is available. Um, <laughs> when's the music video coming out? We're not sure. I'm supposed to get a cut of it today. Oh, my God. <laughs> that sounds exciting. I'm so excited. I keep checking my email. <laughs> Have you, like, what's the big difference between the first cut and the final one? Like, from the well, music videos I've done in the past. Hmm. Oh, my God. It's, a, I mean, it's different for every video. Is like, it, like, night and day? Or is it, like... It really depends. It depends on who you're working with. Like, and it also depends on how clear the plan is going into it. Yeah. A lot of my videos were not very planned. <laughs> so then, like, in the editing process... I have no idea what to expect and I'll get mm. it back and I'll be like, okay, I like this, don't like this, but I don't know. I think 
I think for the Geekin video, I'm really excited to see the first cut, and I have a feeling it'll be very close to the final cut. Nice. Because um, Jisun, the who I'm working with on it, is just incredible, and like her editing skills are. She's really, the really director, cool. or she's a director, editor. Shout yeah, out. Yeah, she shout out Jisun. <laughs> yeah, she's amazing. So That's yeah, awesome. it should be really cool. So when that comes out, you'll probably do some shows. Yeah, I have a show on Thursday, actually. This Thursday? On the 19th, yeah. Whereabouts? Market Hotel. Market Hotel, you heard it here. Heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Any yeah. other shows planned after that? Um, Any tours? Tours, definitely in 2020. Nice. Um, to end 2019, I'm doing a show in New Jersey, my hometown, on the 30th. And then I have another show in like Montclair, which is right next to my hometown. I love Montclair. In January. Oh my god, I love Montclair. It's, it's a, such it's a, a pretty place. town. Yeah. If it wasn't so expensive, I would totally live. There. <laughs> yeah, it's really fucking expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, they got they got really good vegan food. So. So you're playing on the 30th of December. Wow, two days before New Year's. I know, I that's know, amazing. and I'm going to Atlanta right before then. It's gonna be really busy. <laughs> that's that's a wild, wild it's way to wild. Wild way to bring the new year in. <laughs> it is the, bring in the new decade. Can you oh believe my this? Oh, God. I keep tweaking about it when I think it. When I think about it, I'm like, holy shit. It's 2020. We're about to be in the roaring 20s. 2020. Jeez. We're going to thrive. We are. We're going to really do well. Excited. We're all going to do well. I think it's going to be <laughs> the last 10 years that are, like, livable for humanity. <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, we'll, yeah. We'll, we're, be, we we'll all, be okay. Yeah. We'll be fine. We'll, I don't know. If certain <laughs> things change, we'll be fine. <laughs> I guess we'll see. Um, so, uh how long have you been in the music industry per se now? Um, hmm, I guess I, I would consider like, well, I got out of high school like three years ago mm -hmm. and that's when I like fully immersed myself in the industry. Okay, so about three years, right? Three years, yeah. So yeah. like, so the things that you really like about it and there are other things that you absolutely yeah. can't stand. Should I talk about them? Let's, let's do the positive the first. positive first, yeah. okay. Um, well, I really love like all the collaboration and like yeah. the, just the music community. It yeah. has been really incredible. Like, <clears throat> I keep finding myself having these bursts of gratitude where I'm like, "Wow, I'm surrounded by really amazing people mm. who are like really pushing things forward." And yeah, yeah, people. I really like meeting people who aren't concerned about clout and and all the bullshit that comes with being a musician and people who just genuinely want to like connect as humans and make music. That's, so that's been really amazing. Just who I've found myself surrounded by. Yeah, those are um, there are people like that, and they're far and few. But when they're there, it just clicks. Exactly. Totally yeah, you it. meet somebody and you're like, I think I've known you forever. Yeah, <laughs> there's something so deep about whatever it is about music that really connects us. Like when you find that person, it's like you fall in love a little bit. Yeah, no, it? totally. You know? That's what I. That's also something I learned through music that like being in love doesn't have to be a romantic thing. Like right. you can just be in love. Like I feel like I'm in love all the time because I just <laughs> live in love. That's you beautiful. You know what I mean? That's really beautiful. Yeah. Well, really let's nice. switch it over. What, what do you not like? What, or what rather, what like? would you like to change about the music Okay. Industry? Well, I would love all, like, the isms to go away, like, the sexism within music, the racism, like, just all all the oppression that's within the industry. I found just, just as, as a woman, it's definitely been challenging. Like, ha I have very different perspectives of people than like my male peers have like we'll be in this we'll be in a session with somebody or like we'll know somebody in common and they'll be like oh yeah he's such a cool dude like we've made amazing music together and i'll be like oh he like was extremely inappropriate with me and made me feel like an object <laughs> and it's just going back to the subway song right? yeah well it's it. it's sad it's like apparent in everything but i think in music people really get away with it because it's such it's such a casual industry it's like mm. Because music, the, the music industry is like, you're just living in the industry. Right. Um, so there's like really no boundaries. You know how in most industries, it's like you don't combine business and pleasure. But yeah. music is business and pleasure. And pleasure, right. So it's like... I would say entertainment industry in Entertainment general. industry. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So it's yeah. it's a whole lot of like unprofessional people. And So hopefully the next decade will be filled with more professionalism. Yeah, and just right. being surrounded by more professionals. <laughs> more professionals who are in it for the music, not for, for the, the clout. Music. Yeah, and not for in the sex. In it for the love. In it for the love. That's the most important thing. When you're moving with love, you don't have to worry about like offending people, and you don't have to yeah. worry about 
any of that shit because totally it's all love. Speaking of sharing love, is there anybody you want to shout out? Any other artists? That oh, you're- God. Yeah. Shout out to my parents. I, I record at home like I didn't I, I moved away from home for a bit and then I've I've been back for a little while and I'm like so grateful to my parents for allowing me to transform like this office in our crib like into my studio. Big, big shout out to the parents yeah. out there. Much love. Much love. Um, where can people find you? They can find me everywhere at Mia Gladstone. Awesome. Spotify, Apple, whatever. Yeah. Have it. Instagram, Twitter. Uh, so easy. Mia Gladstone. Mia Gladstone. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> and with that, <laughs> do let's last? do the last yeah. song. This is and a song is called Grow. Uh-huh. I produced this myself. What's it about? It is about growing, baby. It's about universal love and everything that fuels my heart. Ah, 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 oh, oh. Baby, I grow like a flower. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah Baby, I grow like a flower I'm like the sweetest of sour I got the flow like a shower Come pick my brain for an hour Finical love or power I hold my ground like a tower Finical, I empower I came to stay, I'm no coward I'm so divine like universal love Oh, uh uh-oh I'm so divine like universal No other couldn't lose. I'm a lover. I tell the truth, but I stutter. Know what to choose. I don't have a no, 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 no. Oh yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm so divine, like universal love. Oh, oh. The dope, the dope, the dope, the dope. So divine, just close your eyes, expose your light. We talk about food, we talk about music, with musical dudes, finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. This program is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.